Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. Friends, let us continue to worship together. Good morning. It's nice to see some new faces along with our familiar faces. Uh, but let's stand together as a body and praise the Lord together. <clears throat> You are 
continue to worship the Lord together. Part of the patterns that we have uh, in singing and hearing the word is to confess, to take this time to be reconciled in our relationship with God together. So we're going to take this time to confess as a community by reading the prayer on the screen together, then praying and confessing as individuals in silence. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please take this time as individuals in silence confessing your sins before God. Friends, look up and receive these words of encouragement. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Let us respond in song. Straight. 
Father, we thank you for pursuing us first, unconditionally. We thank you, Father, for showing us what it looks like to be loved and to love another. We thank you for your presence and for reminding us daily that you are our Father and that we are not alone. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, good morning. Good morning and welcome to Hope Monco. If this is your first time here, welcome. We're so glad to see you here. Hope Monco exists to model the person and work of Jesus. And uh, I, 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 later on, I'm so excited to introduce to you uh, a teacher of mine, a mentor of mine, someone who I've learned from and, and dearly trust, who have modeled uh, Jesus to me every week. And uh, I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about him later on. So uh, please do ex expect that. Now, some of the ways in which hope models the person work of Jesus is not only within this church, but within the community. And there are a lot of things that we do, uh, such as working with the uh, local food cupboard, Maddie Dixon, and other ways as well. So stay tuned um, uh, for ways that which you can jump in together. Now, one quick announcement. Um, Two weeks from now, we have, on the 21st, a picnic. And so we'd love it if you can join us. It would be a time of fellowship. This is the way that we have opportunities to uh, spend time together and model Jesus to each other. Now, with that being said, on the cross, when Jesus died, he brought peace between him and humanity. Let's take that peace and pass it to each other by saying peace be with you, which means uh, greeting each other. So you can take some time to uh, get some coffee and, and find your way back. We'll see you in a minute or so. I get that this could be awkward, so you can just say peace and peace out. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see you there. Uh, kids, you can also take this opportunity. Sam is right there in that gray hoodie sweater. Uh, he is an awesome kids guy, and uh, you, can, you can spend some time with him if you'd like. All right, we'll see you in a minute. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as we continue to worship our Father together, this is a time where we can dive into the Word. And I'd like to just take a few seconds to introduce a teacher, a mentor of mine, uh, Jackson Crum. And before he comes up, I, I just want to acknowledge and, and thank God for the work that he's done through Jackson to me. And the way I met him was interesting. Actually, Steve is right there. Steve uh, hadn't talked to Jackson in 10 years, and I'm praying for a mentor and a teacher. And this journey is, is I'm with you all, but it's been lonely. It's been lonely. And uh, Steve says, uh, okay, hey, let me introduce you to this guy. We don't know. Never talked to him. Shot off an email. Immediate response. Yeah, let me meet this guy, Jacob. And then that was the beginning of a new chapter and story. From then on, and Jackson, uh, I would like to say, isn't just anybody in the church world. And, and we don't want to do that in the church world. We don't want to raise some person up, but this, this is the man. I mean, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's the real deal, right? And so uh, he was transitioning from leading a, a massive church in Chicago to missions in Turkey, and he still gave me time. That's the kind of man this is, who gave time to a no one that he didn't know and said, let me spend time with you. And he's done that through the pandemic till today, every week. This is the man you're hearing from. Humble, and God uses him greatly. Jackson? I don't know, we normally don't applause, but let's applaud. <laughs> there we go. I love your pastor. He has become a friend. You know, you start off in a certain relationship, and then you learn about each other, and we become good friends. And, and I love knowing about him and Jane and the family. And we uh, check in with each other. It's just been a privilege. Uh, I, he, he is incredibly teachable. He's smart as all get out. As if he didn't know. <laughs> and he's, you know, we talk about somebody who goes, oh, I, I used to do this. You're kidding me. And it's just these broad experiences that, that he's had. Anyway, just, man, it, he's a delight. It's, uh, it's, it's a time of the week that I look forward to. 
This is my wife Donna. Donna, why don't you come up and say a couple things? Günaydın. Bu sabah bu sabah burada sizlerle olmaktan çok mutluyuz. Biz şimdi Antalya'da oturuyoruz. And that's all, we won't go any further than that. But that's an introduction to the language that we're trying to learn. Learn, if you're gonna learn a new language, can we just suggest you learn it early? <laughs> <laughs> Don't wait through this this much gray hair. Um, would you, yeah. So this is uh, where we live. You can see Istanbul is up there. We don't typically talk about in public where we are. So look at the map. Straight down where that lovely little arrow is where we stand. This is an amazing location because we think of the Holy Land and we think of um, countries across the sea, but in the land in which we live, everything you see indicated there is a biblical, um, has biblical connotations. The city that we live in is actually the city from which Paul entered and exited on his first missionary journey. When you think Asia Minor, look here. If you think Galatia, Phrygia, um, Colossae, the Seven Church, all kinds of things. So it's a rich, rich land, and it's a privilege for us to be able to live here, more so because of the emergent like one and a half generation church that today is being reestablished in this land. Um, but I want to say thank you to you because Chokteshe could have did them, because you guys have been part of the relief efforts that have hit um, in the, the wake of the earthquake that hit back in February. And if you put up, you are so on top of things. Thank you very much. Um, this is the, the region. Long ago, the numbers of dead stopped being counted. And it stopped at 50,000, and it's arbitrarily kind of seemed like overnight. At least the suggestion is at least 100,000 have lost their lives. But to date, there's still 2.4 million people who've been dis internally displaced because of this. So imagine, remember back in the, the uh, recent hurricane in Florida that did so much damage in Fort Myers and Bonita Springs? Imagine that destruction across the entire state of Florida. That gives you a sense of the area. Antakya, which is biblical Antioch, 90% of the buildings either were destroyed or had to be brought down. So this is a rebuilding process that's going to take literally years, and, and we are grateful, the local fellowship is grateful for the gift that you sent, because they're now in the process of trying to purchase container homes, because people are still in tents, many people, most people are still in tents, and they can't be in tents for two more years. So... They're looking at container homes. So, you know, it's like every $4,000 buys a house for someone. And so we're grateful, and they wanted us to especially make sure that we said thank you to you for your participating with them. Thank you. Thanks. The two red, the two red circles you see up there are uh, places in particular that the Turkish church, the local church, the church I shouldn't mention. <laughs> and the reason being, people are being kicked out of our country on a regular basis, and so people are very, very cautious. Anyway, that's where they're focusing, those two red arrows. This morning, I'm preaching to me. I just want you to know, the message that I'm giving is because I need to hear it. You're just going to have a chance to kind of sit in as God speaks to me. And I hope that God also speaks to you through this. But I, I need to be reminded of this, and I'll explain why in just a second. There is a piano prodigy. He was amazing. He was a young man that people talked about, and, and he was going to give his first concert. And he goes to this beautiful hall, and he comes to the middle with his tucks and his tails, and he bows to the crowd, and he walks over to the piano, and he begins to play for 90 minutes. He doesn't miss a note. He plays, plays with great passion. He has amazing technique. People sat there in awe. It was everything they had heard and everything they believed. And then it was over. And he got up, and he walked over to the middle of the stage, and he stood there. And people slowly began to applaud. I mean, it's like they were just kind of in a trance. And, and then the applaud got louder and louder. And eventually people are standing up and saying, bravo, bravo. And yet this young man just stood and he looked straight back. And he looked back to the first balcony in the middle seat. And he stood there, and he looked, and he looked. In fact, he looked so long, it became uncomfortable that people in the crowd began to turn around to see, who is he looking at? And the only one sitting down in the whole beautiful theater was an older man with a big white beard. And the young man stood, and he looked, and he looked, and finally the man in the white beard began to clap. 
And then he stood up. And then the young prodigy got a big smile on his face. Why? Because that's his teacher. That's who applause mattered to him. Now let me ask you, who sits in that chair? In your life, who sits in that chair? We all have someone who sits in that chair. Is it your parents? Is it your spouse? Is it your boss? Your friends, the opinion of others, the need for success? Who sits in that chair? Who do you keep looking back to and going, I need that applause? Because we've all got it. And frankly, many times, that's our idol that sits in that chair. Let me pray. Father God, we invite you into this space. We know you're here. We know you're everywhere at the same time. But we're very mindful to stop and to ask, would you move in our lives? Would you speak to us? Would your spirit convict us? and encourage us with your spirit reveal to us the things we need to know and be reminded about you. Father, I pray, as uh, Isaiah says, that as your word goes out, may it not return to you without you accomplishing your agenda in the hearts of people. We remind ourselves what James says, that your word comes and that it would speak to us that we would not be merely hearers of your word, that we would be doers of your word, putting it into practice. Father, if I would say anything that's not of you, may it quickly be forgotten, for I will only tend to confuse. But it's when I say your words after you that I have great hope that work will be done as your spirit brings it to bear in our life. Now, with your heads bowed, let me ask you, maybe you just pray pray this simple prayer this morning. Father God, what do you have for me? I want to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. There's four broad areas of our lives, Donna's my life right now, that we are just battling in. One is our family. One of our sons and his family are going through an incredibly hard time. Donna's mother was in hospice, then died, and Donna's now involved with her three sisters in getting her mom's house in order. Our home church had a mini explosion, and it affected our our immediate area of ministry where we're currently living. Several people who are overseeing around the world have had some serious issues they were working through and that Donna needed to step into. And then our adopted country has literally been rocked by this earthquake. At first, I got to be honest, I was disappointed in how folks were acting and how folks were responding and things that they were saying in several of these situations. And I worked hard to respond in a very godly way. I I worked hard to be mindful of how God would want me to respond in these things. But then I just got fed up. I got fed up with these people and the way they were treating each other, especially treating people that we care deeply about, the things they said to the ones we loved, our friends, our family. And then being told they can't say anything back. They can't respond in any way. They were just supposed to take it. The freedom that sometimes people feel in the church to say whatever they want to each other and spiritualize it. And then my disappointment turned to discouragement. Frankly, I got overwhelmed with it. My heart rate would go up every time I'd have a phone call with one of these folks or a Zoom call. I was getting sick to my stomach. I began to wonder what else is going to happen, what else possibly could happen. One day I was out walking and praying to God, and I said to him, God, I love your church. I just don't love your people. God, I love your church. I'm just sick of your people. Wrong? Yeah, yeah. I know, but in the ugliest of my heart, it was how I was feeling. Not an excuse, it's just the reality of the ugliness and the darkness of my heart in that moment. It is never pleasant to come face to face with the darkness of your own soul, is it? I had lost sight of what God wanted to do. 
frankly, I wondered at times if he even cared. It's like, God, I have prayed and I have prayed and I have prayed and I have asked and you have not answered one of my prayers like I've asked. And my view of God began to shrink. And my frustration increased. And I put myself in the chair. What I wanted mattered most. I knew what was best. I knew what needed to be done. And it wasn't happening. And I became incredibly discouraged. See, there's a difference between disappointment and discouragement, isn't there? Disappointment. I have expectations. I have a mental picture of how things are going to turn out. I had a mental picture of the Eagles winning the Super Bowl. I had a mental picture of the Phillies winning the World Series. I've got a mental picture of the Sixers getting past the second round. We get a mental picture of planning a day with our spouse or a friend and it not quite turning out like we'd hope or a grade on a paper that we would invested a lot of time in and we're not getting the grade that we thought we should get or a relationship that we've invested in and it's just not quite what we had hoped. There are times disappointment is real. There are times we deal with severe disappointment, hearing the C word when we visit a doctor not having children as quickly as we want to. We're not married yet. Your children aren't living up to your expectations. You're not getting the promotion you think you've earned. You're not getting the recognition you think you've earned. But disappointment is not without hope. Why? Because we still see God as sovereign. God is still God. God sits in the seat. God is still in control. He is powerful. He is personal. And we go, okay, We're going to trust you with this. Disappointment says, I understand God's in control. Things haven't turned out the way I want them to, but God is still in control. Disappointment is seeing our life situation through the grid of a sovereign God. But discouragement, on the other hand, discouragement is seeing seeing our life without God in it. Discouragement. I have expectations that things will turn out well for me according to my plan, according to my desires, and they haven't. Discouragement. Intense feelings of life just stinks. Things are not getting better. I don't have control. I want out. Things will never improve. My health will not get better. The pain will not stop. The pattern of sin will never be conquered. I will never get recognition at work. I will never get married. My roommate situation will never improve. My relationship with my mother or father will not get better. My marriage stinks and my spouse will never change. I will never see the change in relationships I was hoping for. I cannot change these things. And discouragement hits. I thought many a time, this is not how things should be. For those who deal with disappointment, remember that God is still God. Those of us who struggle with discouragement battle with, we're not God. And we want to be. Because if I was in control, things would look different. We may never verbalize that, but we wrestle with that. Because we want to sit in a chair. For many of us, we're not asking God, what do you have for me? Instead, we're saying, God, here's what I have for you to do. Here's my agenda. We want a life free of suffering and hardship and worry and loss. A life that is successful as I choose to define success. We want to be God. Maybe you're not God, but you expect God to be what you want him to be. Bless me, give to me, do this. We don't want God, we want Aladdin. You know what I mean? We want the genie, we want to rub the bottle. That's what we really want. We want to be in the chair. 
We want to control. Discouragement. My expectation that things will turn out well for me according to my plan, and they haven't. You know, spiritual warfare, discouragement is a major tool in the hands of the evil one in our lives. The evil one whispers in our ear, God is not good. God is not able. God can't be trusted. God's not in control. We hear this voice, and we believe it. The big question is, how do I move from discouragement back to disappointment? Well, i tell you what I needed. I needed a renewed view for a discouraged soul. I needed a renewed view of God. I needed to get my fanny out of the chair and put God back in his right place in my life. My view of God was too small. You know what I learn and what I'm learning about myself and about others? Difficult times reveal to us what we really think about God. Suffering, discouragement really begins to show us what we truly think about God. Let's look at Isaiah 6. It's in your program. You can turn with me there. You know, it's interesting in the Bible how people encounter God tells you a a bit about their life situation. Many times we don't get the full context. We just see their interaction with God. But how they interact with God, how God reveals himself, tells us a lot more about the context than may we originally see in the the, uh, text. Their struggle, their, their issue. And this passage tells us about Isaiah. And I'm going to propose to you, I think Isaiah was greatly discouraged. When you read the first few chapters, I just got finished reading through the book of Isaiah. My wife and I, Donna and I, are reading through the Old Testament this year. And I just got finished reading through Isaiah. In the first five chapters, life is bad, man. It is bad. And Isaiah is called into this very difficult situation. Isaiah is watching the kingdom go into ruin And then he watched his king. We know from Jewish history, not from the Bible, but from Jewish history, that the king at the time was also Isaiah's cousin. And he watched the king at this time, who started out so good, so good, we watched this king go bad. King Uzziah. Look with me at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, now, let me pause. He died in 943 B.C., In 2 Chronicles 26, it describes for us Uzziah. And it starts off with all this good stuff that Isaiah does. All these things that he does for the kingdom. All these things that he does as a king. Man, it's a great resume. But then we get to verse 16 and it starts with the word, but. You never want your biography to start really well and then have the word, but. We'll put it up here on the screen, Chase. But when he was strong, Uzziah, he grew proud to his destruction, for he was unfaithful to the Lord his God, and he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, let me show you a picture. Chase, you put that next one up there. Here's a picture of the temple. And what happened is Uzziah began to think, I am so good, I am so powerful, I am so wonderful, God has blessed me in so many ways. He lost sight of what his role was to be, how well it was defined. He was king, he was not priest. So he goes into the temple, he walks in here, and he comes to the altar of incense, and he's going to offer the incense on the altar where the little coals are going. Eighty priests walk into the temple and confront him. You talk about some brave priests. Because the king could have easily said, off with their head. And they come in and they confront him and they say to him, this is not your role, this is not your job. He resists them. They push him out of the temple. And as he exits the temple, he becomes white with leprosy. So Isaiah is gone. My cousin, he's king, good dude, man, good dude. Things are going to be good because my king, my my cousin, the king. And what happens? 
Look with me as we go farther here in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. In the year of King Uzziah, I saw it. Now, that's language in the Hebrew Bible for vision. God gave Isaiah a vision. Now, the vision doesn't come out of anywhere. There's a reason that God gives him this vision. And again, I'm going to propose to you, I think Isaiah was greatly discouraged. But God reveals something about his character and his nature in this vision for Isaiah. Notice where the throne is. The throne is in the temple. Where's it supposed to be? It's supposed to be in the palace. No, our king, our king's throne is in the temple. Why? Because he is not only all-powerful, but he's worthy of our worship. The king sits on the throne in the temple, and his train fills the temple. Now, you know what a train is, but let me show you. Chase? Chase? Now, I read this, thought it was fascinating, that when kings conquered another king, they would cut off the train of the conquered king, and they would sew it on to the length of their train. So when you went to visit the king, you would have to pass all these different trains that were sold on, sewed on to the train of the king that you're going to go visit. It was a reminder to you of his power. It reminded you of all the peoples he had conquered. It reminded you that you should be fearful of this one. How large is the train of our king? It fills the temple. The power of our king. It says there's smoke. We know from the Old Testament, smoke is an indication of God's presence. God's Shekinah glory is there. There's seraphim. In the Bible, there's these two funky characters, cherubim and seraphim. And we got seraphim here that are flying around the throne, these angels. With two, they cover their eyes. Why? Because they're before the Lord. And two, they cover their feet. This is holy ground. And two, they fly. And what do they say? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his, his glory. Thrice holy, a superlative meaning that his holiness is beyond human expression. You know the number three is the word for completeness. Holiness defines everything about God. It's the only attribute of God that's used twice, three times, here in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Revelation. Why? It is saying to us everything about God, God's holy. God's wisdom is holy. God's strength is holy. God's justice is holy. God's power is holy. God's wrath is holy. Everything about God is holy. Without blemish, it's perfect. Isaiah needed to be reminded who's sitting in the chair. What's your view of God? How big is your view of God? How powerful is your God? I was in this season where my God was shrinking every day. Every day he was shrinking. My view of him was shrinking. There's some of us in this room that are going through things that need to be reminded that our God is big and our God is holy and our God is powerful and our God is personal. How do you grow your view of God? Reading the Bible and asking God to show you. Going back to the Gospels and reminding yourself again who Jesus is. There's many, been many seasons in my life where I've gone back to the Gospels to say, God, remind me again, who is this one that I love? 
We go back to the word. I know it's what we say. It's what we say. We're Christians. Of course, we say go back to the word. But you know what? It's true. It's true. Reading through Isaiah remind me again, whoa, my God is big. You know what else helps us get our view of God? Listening to others describe God. At Westminster, I went to Westminster, the same place where the Apostle Paul went to school. <laughs> and I took a class with a guy named J.I. Packer. Packer wrote Knowing God. And it was a two-week class, and I was so excited because as a young follower of Christ in college, I read Knowing God. It rocked my world. I was so excited to be able to take a class with a guy, J.I. Packer. And J.I. Packer, I sat in the very back, typical of me, I sat in the very back. And J.I. Packer stood up front like this. He closed his eyes, his fingers like this, and he would talk for three hours about God. And I remember I'm taking notes, keeping up with him, and I remember putting my pencil down once and looked at him, and I thought to myself, I don't know God the way he's describing. I don't know that God. The richness, the understanding, the depth of his knowledge of God, it shook me. I was a pastor. Praying prayers of adoration and thanksgiving can increase our view of God. Something we used to do with our boys when they were young, and I still do, is we pray through the alphabet, and for every letter we would think of something to pray for. Do it and just think of praise and adoration to God. It forces you. It increases your understanding. You think outside the box and the norm. You read books that describe the greatness of God. Let me put three up here. Again, three that I read as a young follower, and I continue to read. A.W. Pink's book, The Sovereignty of God. Oh, oh man. Not thick, but rich. Packer's book, Knowing God, especially chapter four. Holy mackerel, my wife's and I favorite chapter. A.W. Tozier who was a pastor in Chicago, where I pastored for 16 years. Knowledge of the holy. He starts off, the most important thing about you is what you think about God, because what you think about God will define everything else you think about. We read other things. The Bible, first and foremost, but then we read other things that remind us, oh my goodness, my God is big. See, encountering God and gaining a right perspective of God gives us then a right perspective of ourselves. What happens when I shrink God, I make myself bigger. I know better. This is how it ought to be. I put myself in the chair. I move God to the side. But when I get a right view of God, I put God back in the chair and I get a right view of myself. When I was at Church of the Savior in Wayne, uh, the uh, chaplain for the Eagles went to our church. And he came up to me one Sunday and he said, uh, Jackson, I'm going to be out of town a couple of weekends during the football season. Would you be interested in doing the chapel before he could finish? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so for a couple of years, when he was out of town, he would invite me to go and I'd take my boys. Well, it was during the time when a guy named Reggie White. Do you remember Reggie White or heard of him? Some of you weren't even born yet. I know. I'm looking over at the guy and going, no, Reggie White. 6'5". <laughs> Let me show you a pic. There he is. 285 pounds, quick as a cat, one of the best 100 players ever in the NFL, in the Hall of Fame, a strong follower of Jesus, too. Well, we're doing a Bible study. Josh is with me. And after the Bible study is over, I'm sitting and chatting with the guy next to me. Reggie White walks up to me, and he stands in front of me, and he blocks out the sun. He seemed bigger than 6'5", I kid you not. He was huge. He was a refrigerator with a head on it. And he came with that gravelly voice that he had, and he shook my hand. And when, and when I shook his hand, my hand got lost in his. It was like shaking a frying pan. The guy was humongous. And seriously, the thought that went through my mind in that moment was, he could pick me up, shake me, and kill me, and there's nothing I could do about it. And you know, I'm a big guy. I'm almost 6'2". I'm 200 pounds. I, I'm no small thing. I'm no little frail thing. But I'm next to Reggie White, and my goodness gracious. 
you get a view of someone like that and you get a better understanding of who you're not. When I get up next to God and I read about God and I think about God and I pray to this God, I get a better view of me. My view of me shrinks and frankly, it needed to shrink. A holy and powerful view of God stirs each of us to respond just like Isaiah. Look down with me at verse 5. And I said, Isaiah speaking, woe is me. Now, you've read Isaiah, many of you. He woes a lot of people in the book of Isaiah. (laughs) He pronounces judgment on a lot of people. A lot of nations. Man, it's just chapter after chapter. The Edomites, the Ammonites, the Moabites. I mean, he just goes when he's not woeing the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Woe is me. For I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Whoa, judgment. What's he do? He pronounces judgment on himself. Woe is me. He stands before our holy God and he feels he's condemned. Someone must come to his rescue because Isaiah is not in a place that he can save himself. He looks at the people and he sees no one there who can save him. His his cousin, the king, couldn't have saved him. But folks, there is always hope for the one who is judged. And it's the king who provides for the one who is judged. It's the king who provides. Now, who is this king? Who is this king that we see here in Isaiah 6? Well, John the gospel writer tells us, and we'll put it up here on the screen in John 12, 41. It says, Isaiah said these things because, and just as Jesus began, he saw his glory and spoke of him. Jesus. Isaiah saw Jesus sitting on the throne. The greatest blessing to humanity arrived not in a palace, but in a stable with a throne, not in the palace, but in the temple. Jesus is the only king who is worthy to present himself for the sake of others. This king provides a redemptive work. He gives us a glimpse of a redemptive work. Look with me at verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sins atoned for. Would you put that next picture up for me, Chase? Right there. Outside the temple was the altar where they would bring the sacrifices, the sin sacrifice. It is a picture of what is to come. An angel flies, and he takes a coal, and he brings it, and he touches his lips. Behold, this touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Atonement. Atonement is offered for those who stand in judgment. We have all stood in a place of judgment and have experienced the power and the grace of atonement as followers of Jesus. The king provides for Isaiah what he could never provide for himself. The king steps off his throne and he steps onto a cross to provide atonement for humanity. For those who engage by faith in the work that has been done in the death of Jesus. Go back with me to verse 4 for a second. Look what it says. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. Do you know when the temple shakes again? The temple shakes again, it tells us in Matthew, when Jesus hangs on a cross and he says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And he becomes gigantic sin for the world. The temple shakes again. When atonement is accomplished, The provision of our king 
when we think about the redemptive work of the powerful king, it should stir a gratefulness in our heart. We should stop and continually be saying, thank you, God, for what you have done. We work through discouragement by seeing life through the lens of gratefulness. What we have, what he has done, not my agenda, but yours, Lord. Let me remind you of Ephesians 5.20. We'll put it up here on the screen. Paul writes to a church in my country, in the city of Ephesus, and he says to them, don't get drunk with lying, that leads to debauchery. Instead, you be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, always and for everything? No, you can't, po- Lord, you can't possibly mean always and for everything. Always and for everything. When you can begin to look at God and say to him for the difficulties you're going through, God, thank you, you've allowed these into my life. You will move from discouragement back to disappointment. When I was out walking one day and was finally able to say, this seems unfair. I am so frustrated with your people. But God, you are sovereign, and you've allowed this to happen to each one of these people because this is under your plan and under your control, for you are good and you are kind. You are not malicious. He began to move back to the chair. There was a season when Don and I were going through, like we all do, going through a difficult season. This is years ago. And my mother called, and I answered the phone. This is back in the day when we had a phone in the house. I answered the phone, and my mother, first thing, what's wrong? All I said was, hello. You know how mothers are. They got this radar. What's wrong? I'm good. No, something's wrong. No, honestly, Mom, I'm good. I'm trying to hide it. I don't want to get into it. You know what I mean? I don't want to go through it all with her. And then she said an incredibly wise thing. She said, What are you thankful for that God did yesterday in your life? Yeah, I don't know. I journaled. And so at the end of all my journal entries on whatever day, I would write the word joy, and I'd write a a dash, and I'd put down where I saw God move in my life yesterday. And you flip back over the pages, and you go, whoa, whoa what God has done, because I am quick to forget. We journal joy moments in our life. Thank you that you have not forgotten me, that you are engaged with me. i got to be honest with you. I'm 66 years old. When I was 30, I looked at people at 66. I go, man, they got to figure it out. Life is smooth at that point. <laughs> and then I got here, and it ain't the truth. Because God's not done with us yet. We will move from discouragement to disappointment when we recognize that God is using our difficult season to reveal to us our inadequate view of him. In my situation the past few months, my God shrunk. I moved him out of the chair. I sat in that chair because I thought I knew best. And little did I know that I needed a fresh view of God. Look with me, verse 8, and we'll begin to round the corner and head home. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Now, do you think the Lord doesn't know? Do you think he's waiting for people to raise their hand? Hey, I'm just asking, anybody available? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? He knows what he has done. He knows how he's engaged with Isaiah. He knows what's going on in Isaiah's heart. Now Isaiah is ready to say, here I am, send me. Now I'm ready. Boy, he has a hard ministry. You discouraged? You discouraged? 
Who's sitting in the chair? Whose approval do you need? Whose control do you need to have? Who sits in the chair? Folks, we will never change from discouragement back to disappointment unless we recognize that we need it. And the work of grace is God whispering in your ear, nudging you in your heart right now, saying, that's you. Don't justify it. Don't pass it off. Submit to it. It is me, Lord. It is me. Let's pray. Father God, you are gracious and kind to us. You're amazing to us. And how quickly we forget. Father, there are some of us in this room that are in the midst of discouragement or just coming out of discouragement or heading into discouragement. And we need to be reminded we have moved you out of the chair. Father, give us a growing picture of who you are, your greatness, your power, your amazing grace. And may we trust your words when you say, for all things work to your glory for those who love him. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jackson. As we continue on in worship, We come to a portion where we prepare our hearts to participate in the Lord's Supper together. And this is an awesome and wonderful way to remember who God is. A time to pray together and increase our view of God. As we pray together, prayers of the people... I will read a prayer on the screen here and give you a few moments to pray. I will say, in your mercy, and if you can respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray. We praise you, God, our creator, for your handiwork in shaping and sustaining your wondrous creation. We especially thank you for the miracle of life and the wonder of living, particular blessings coming to us in this day. The resources of the earth, gifts of creative vision and skillful craft, the treasure stored in every human life. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for others, God our Savior, claiming your love in Jesus Christ for the whole world and committing ourselves to care for those around us in his name. We especially pray for those who work for the benefit of others who cannot work today, those who teach and those who learn, people who suffer poverty in the church in persecution. In your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our creator, yours is the morning and yours is the evening. Let Christ, the son of righteousness, shine forever in our hearts and draw us to the light of your radiant glory. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, our redeemer.
In your mercy, hear our prayer. For centuries, Christians have recited the Apostles' Creed to not only remember God's greatness and his power, but to put him back in the seat, to put him back in the chair. Let's all stand. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and suffered death. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us close today in song. those last few words, not my will, but yours be done. Take that. Receive it. Take the blessings that you have received through the word today. Hold on to it. Remember the greatness of God. Now for the next six days, model that to those in your home, to those in your community, and in your workplace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Friends, go in peace and serve the Lord.